Archaic Records. My lords and ladies, reenacting that famous feat of William Tell. Whoa! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Archaic Records here with you again. My name is Jamie, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Here to wish you a very happy Morrissey Monday, a weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths. And before we get into this week's episode, I have to go back to last week and make a correction. During the final segment of last week's video, as I was discussing Johnny Marr's upcoming late summer and fall tour of the United States with the band James, I kept inadvertently stating that his show at the Warfield in San Francisco was on July 23rd, when it is in fact on September 23rd. I used the word July probably three or four times. Sometimes when I do these videos, I kind of get into this sort of stream of consciousness thing. And my mouth starts rattling a lot faster than my brain is able to keep up. <laughs> I know that's really hard to imagine. But anyway, the show at the Warfield in San Francisco is September 23rd. It is a show that I will be at. I am extremely excited to see Johnny Marr. Not to mention... Seeing the band James as well. I am a relatively big James fan as well. I saw James once a long time ago, and that band is awesome live. Uh, anyway, today is Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. So once again, I am a day late in bringing you this week's Morrissey Monday. Although, if you think about it, yesterday was a federal holiday, at least here in the United States. So I guess you could sort of say technically today is like a Monday. Anybody out there buying that? Uh, anyway, this past weekend was Memorial Day weekend, at least here in the United States. If you are unfamiliar with what Memorial Day is, Memorial Day is sort of like our unofficial beginning of summer. It is a federal holiday that is designed to honor those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the pursuit of other countries' natural resources. And out here in Tennessee, Memorial Day is a huge thing. Now, where I'm from in California, you know, Memorial Day isn't necessarily this big hootenanny. But out here in Tennessee, people tend to be a lot more patriotic, a lot more conservative, a lot more evangelical. And for some reason, those people really value death, despair, and destruction. You know, Jesus was a big warmonger, don't you? It's interesting, though, out here in certain parts of the United States, some people have sort of began changing the verbiage when it comes to Memorial Day because they don't necessarily like that it has this connection to war, which I completely understand. I am a, as pacifist as it gets. But I also sort of find the changing of the verbiage Memorial Day to be a little bit Disrespectful, not to mention not really necessary. It reminds me of the old joke about the neo-Nazi on Martin Luther King Day. I mean, you don't necessarily have to, you know, agree with the politics. Just take the paid day off, son! So anyway, if you are here in the United States, I hope you had an awesome Memorial Day weekend. Uh, my wife and I spent our Memorial Day yesterday out at the Tennessee Renaissance Festival. This was our second trip out there this season. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with what the Renaissance Festival is, it is relatively self-explanatory. My wife is a huge 
Renaissance nerd and has been basically her whole life. I had never been to the Renaissance Fair myself until her and I began dating some 12 or 13 years ago. And I have to be honest with you, during my first trip to my first Renaissance festival, I was a little bit skeptical. I'm not going to lie to you. But over the years, it is something that I've actually grown to enjoy quite a bit, and it's something that I look forward to pretty much every year. Now, we don't always go twice every year. We went a couple weeks ago with a group of friends, and my wife and I woke up yesterday, it being Memorial Day, both of us having the day off of work, realizing that we didn't really have any other plans, so we decided to spend our day at the Renaissance Fair. It was the last day of the Tennessee Renaissance Festival yesterday, so it drew a big, big crowd. It's always encouraging when you see big crowds at things uh, like this. And generally speaking, the people that go to the Renaissance Festival are really just awesome, fun, you know, positive people who are just out there really, you know, living out their passion, which is something that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Now, it's interesting out here in Tennessee... The Renaissance Festival is in Williamson County, which is about 40 miles south of the city of Nashville. And Williamson County is in a region of Tennessee that I like to refer to as Stick in its Assistan. And the Renaissance Festival here in Tennessee, up until a few years ago, was run by a private organization who, at some point in time, they sold out to the county, and now the county of Williamson County runs the Renaissance Festival. And since Williamson County has taken over the Tennessee Renaissance Festival, they've done everything within their power to sort of wring out as much fun as they possibly can. The first thing they did when they took over was they banned the al the sale of alcohol on the site of, you know, the fairgrounds that host the Tennessee Renaissance the Tennessee Renaissance Festival. Now, for me, you know, this isn't really that big of a deal. I understand that this is a family sort of environment. There are a lot of kids. You don't necessarily want people walking around getting completely shit hammered. Now, in all the years that my wife and I went to the Renaissance Festival in California and in Tennessee before they banned the sale of alcohol, I never really saw that becoming a huge problem. I never one time saw anybody acting inappropriately or belligerent or falling down or puking or being vulgar. Uh, but to me, okay, you want to ban the sale of alcohol. There's children here. It's a family environment. I have no problem with that. Let's move on. But this year, what Williamson County attempted to do, now luckily they sort of failed in this, but one thing that they attempted to do this year was ban cleavage. Now you're treading on pretty thin ice, my friends, because I don't know what to tell you. I love knockers. I love all knockers. Big knockers, small knockers, fat knockers, toned knockers. I'm just a boob guy. Can't help it. And when you threaten to take away cleavage from the Renaissance Festival, you're starting to hit pretty close to where I live, son. And also, have you ever been to the Tennessee Ren or to any Renaissance Festival? I mean, the Renaissance Festival is basically turkey legs, joust, cleavage. I mean, that is base the three basic uh, food groups. So I had no idea. Now, fortunately, you know, this was something that didn't come to fruition because everywhere you looked, there were just heaping mounds of cleavage, fortunately for me. Now, I'm a red-blooded American male. <laughs> That's something that I look forward to every year when I go to the Tennessee Renaissance Festival. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, the Renaissance Fair is something that my wife is very passionate about. And like I said before, this is just a group of people that go out there. They have fun. A lot of people dress up in period pieces. Uh, you know, this is just something, it's a subculture of people that are a little bit nerdy, but they celebrate being nerdy, something that I can relate to. Now, you might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with Morrissey? Hey, nothing, really. I mean, this week's topic 
doesn't really take that long to discuss as far as Morrissey Monday goes. So what I'm doing here is I'm sort of stretching the Kool-Aid a little bit. Now, if you're wondering what stretching the Kool-Aid is, I discussed what stretching the Kool-Aid is back on one of my videos where I discussed the Morrissey album Southpaw Grammar. So feel free to go back and uh, check that out. Uh, but yesterday being Monday, my wife and I being at the Renaissance Festival, we were talking about Morrissey Monday. And my wife and I were asked, we were sort of having this conversation, what would it be like, it, you know, would Morrissey, would he be a fan of going to something like the Renaissance Festival? Now, for one thing, there is a lot of meat at the Renaissance Festival, so that might be a little bit of a deal breaker as far as Morrissey's concerned. But I can also imagine, we were talking about this yesterday, I can also imagine Morrissey being in a group of four friends who were all driving to the Renaissance Festival. Festival and Morrissey sort of goes begrudgingly because his friends are doing it. He doesn't have any other plans. So he's the guy kind of sitting in the backseat of the car like the stupid idiots. Why do I even hang out with these guys? But as he got there, you know, and after about halfway through the day, he would probably, it would be semi-contagious, the people who were just sort of having a good time and you know, being nerdy and, you know, living out their sort of passion and their fantasy. And I think it would actually sort of win Morrissey over, not to mention the fact that, you know, you are sort of celebrating uh, England and people are dressed up, you know, in a lot of sort of period costumes. Uh, you know, some of the things are sort of historically, you could make the argument, there are things that you see that are historically inaccurate. For one, I would imagine that the obesity rate at the Renaissance Festival is slightly higher than that uh, during the actual Renaissance itself. But we happen to live in 2024, and I'm not saying that as if I'm Richard Simmons over here. It was just something that kind of uh, popped into my head yesterday as we were walking around. Uh, but my wife and I thought it was an interesting question. Would Morrissey have fun at the Renaissance Festival? I like to think that he although he may sort of poo-poo it during the first half of the day, eventually the sort of positive vibes and the people just having a good time around him uh, and the music and the shows uh, would sort of rub off on him and he would end up leaving having had a good time. Uh, to me, that's one of the highlights, probably the highlight of the Renaissance Festival as far as I'm concerned. Now, I don't necessarily go there shopping for trinkets. My wife does. I'm not necessarily into all of that. But for me, what I love the most or the little skit shows that you see, and the music. And yesterday we actually got to see a pretty good little band play, a band called The Secret Commonwealth. I went and picked up a copy of their record after we saw them play. Uh, I had a brief conversation with their lead singer, Troy, who turned out to be a really awesome guy. Can't wait to actually listen to this record they are on spotify if you're interested it's just sort of old-timey renaissance celtic influence string music uh it came with this pretty cool lyric sheet some nice photographs of the band they are all tremendous musicians like i said they are on spotify there's the lyric sheet for the record also uh, they sort of threw in this little 45 a couple halloween tracks uh, that apparently did not make the final cut on this record, at least that's what the singer uh, Troy was telling us uh, yesterday. So check them out if you're interested in that sort of Renaissance-inspired Celtic music. I definitely think you could do a lot worse. Uh, anyway, let's get into today's topic. Before the four of you that watch this channel, burn it down! <laughs> so today we're going back to 1983, May of 1983 as we talk a little bit about the Smith's Peel Session recordings. These recordings, this was re these were recorded at BBC One Studio on May 18th, 1983. They originally broadcast on May 31st, 1983, of course, on the John Peel Show. John Peel, if you are unfamiliar with John Peel. He, of course, was a legendary British British disc jockey who unfortunately passed away in 2004. John Peel was very revolutionary when it came to the music that he broadcast throughout the 
UK. He was known as being one of the first disc jockeys to really play psychedelic music as well as uh, progressive uh, punk, post-punk, and new wave music. And for bands in Britain, young and upcoming bands, the John Peel show really became kind of a rite of passage for any artists that were sort of looking to gain national exposure. And for me, personally speaking, I am just obsessed with these little four-song John Peel EPs. Now, of course, The Smiths, to me, this is my favorite one I've ever heard. But even in this series, uh, just from the ones in The Smiths case, you've got Gang of Four, uh, The Buzzcocks, Joy Division, New Order, Chameleons, Prong, uh, In Spiral Carpets, Happy Mondays, uh, The Cure, which is one of my favorite ones as well, Susie and the Banshees, which is another one of my favorite ones, The Damned, uh, Napalm Death. Might take a pass on the Napalm Death one if you don't mind. I've never really been a big fan of the <laughs> death metal stuff, but if that's your luggage, then so be it. Uh, I would also rec highly recommend you check out uh, the Pogues Peel Session. And one of my all-time favorite ones also is one that just sort of came out on Spotify and on CD. I have it on CD. I don't have it on vinyl. I know it is out on vinyl, but the Echo and the Bunnymen uh, Peel Sessions uh, is awesome too. Echo and the Bunnymen, probably one of my top three, five favorite bands of all time. Uh, but anyway, like I mentioned, this was recorded... Uh, at BBC One on May 18th, 1983, it was uh, it first broadcast on May 31st, 1983. Now, this CD was originally released in October of 1988, but that being said, three of the four songs that are on this EP were previously available on the Hatful of Hollow compilation album the only song off this record or off of this ep that wasn't previously available was uh, the second track on this ep which is a miserable lie uh, the ep starts off with the song what difference does it make uh, this is a great live version of the song what difference does it make it is very true to the recorded version uh, to me of course what difference does it make is probably one of the most iconic songs in the entire Smiths catalog, not to mention one of the best. Uh, to me, this song is sort of about two, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, one finds something out about the other one that, to them, they sort of, I guess, consider it to be a bit of a deal breaker, and the, the friendship, you know, sadly dissolves. I've heard it said, I, I don't disagree with this necessarily, but I've heard it said that one of the friends finds out that the other one is gay and has a hard time with it. And basically, uh, the friendship dissolves after that. And if you listen to the lyrics to the song, which is, of course, brilliantly written by Morrissey. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Uh, it does remind me a little bit of my best friend and I. Uh, growing up now, neither of us were gay. Though people, I think people thought we were because we were so inseparable from like middle school all the way to near the end of high school, in fact. I do remember that he and I hit some sort of static uh, towards the last half of our senior year of high school. And we actually quit hanging out for a while. And I remember one time somebody asked me a question about my friend. His name's Tim. I've brought him up on this channel before. And I think it was something like, hey, when you see Tim, can you tell him this or ask him this? And I remember telling the person instead of just saying, yeah, cool, okay. I had to be sort of dramatic about it. It's like, oh, Tim and I aren't friends anymore. And I remember the person, I remember who it was, too. I remember they even said, well, did you guys break up? <laughs> I was like, wow. Maybe me and Tim are a little bit too close, or a little bit were too close. Uh, that being said, you know, Tim and I, my friend Tim and I, we've been through some definitely some rough patches in our friendship. But, you know, the fact that he and I are still friends after... Basically, 35 years is something that I do not take for granted, at least anymore. There were probably times that I do. And his friendship, to me, is now one of my most prized possessions, along with my marriage and my family and my Morrissey records. <laughs> uh, but this is a great version of the song, What Difference Does It Make? If you want to hear, actually, if you want to hear a really good uh, 
a cover version of the song What Difference Does It Make, I would highly recommend checking out the band Face to Face. And they put out a cover record, I believe it was called Standards and Practices. Uh, but they do actually a pretty good version of the song What Difference Does It Make on that. Actually, they just re- they just released a second standards and practices which i have not listened to yet but the first one's actually pretty good they do uh, they cover the smiths they cover in excess they cover the pogues a few other bands that are pretty snug in my opinion the second song on this album is miserable eye the only song off of this ep that is not included on hatful of hollow this is a sort of a clanky kind of sounding version of the song clanky in a good way uh, all four songs on this EP are just played brilliantly, by the way. Um, to me, this song has always been about sort of the disappointment, I guess, in uh, you know losing your virginity. I love the lyric, I look at yours, you laugh at mine. I've probably been put in that position myself, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Uh, Morrissey talks about or it's he has talked in the past, Morrissey has talked about in the past, that he lost his virginity at the age of 13. And I can tell you that I was not in that same boat, son. Uh, but I do remember I was, you know, I was 19 when I lost my virginity. And the way it happened for me, I can sort of relate to it being kind of disappointing because at a certain age, I probably around... Like middle school, probably, you know, I just became very interested in girls, basically overnight. It went from one day where I, girls were of no use, little interest to me, to basically when you start seventh grade, you come back from that summer, and, you know, girls start to develop, and they develop in ways that are very appealing to young men who are sort of going through hormonal changes, and for me, I just became very fixated on girls. And it wasn't until the age of 19 when I actually lost my virginity. And, you know, so for probably six, seven years, I had built it up in my head as if it was going to be probably the greatest moment of my life. And the way it happened was I was working, I was at work one night and I was, I had this female coworker and her and I were friendly at work. It wasn't anything that was like obvious that we had feelings for each other or liked each other. I don't think that we even necessarily did, but I remember I was going to walk across the street. I was working in Chico at the time and I was going to go across the street and I was going to see the movie from dusk till dawn in the theater after I got off work. And I had mentioned it to this female coworker who she sort of like invited herself. She's like, Oh, I want to see that movie too. We should go. Let's hang out. I was like, yeah, cool. We're, you know, we're friendly enough at work. It doesn't have to be anything. I remember we saw the movie and thought the movie was pretty good. I still like that movie. It's still now I have this memory associated with it from that night. And I remember after the movie, um, I was like, okay, I'm going to go home now. And I had just moved into my own apartment uh, after I had been living in a house with roommates. And the house with roommate situation kind of fell apart because all the roommates... None of the roommates really ended up getting along with each other. So I moved into my own little studio apartment, which I was very proud of. I loved this little apartment. It was something that was like mine. And I didn't have to deal with roommates. And it was just something that I was very happy about. And I remember I had probably been talking about it at work. I remember uh, she said, hey, why don't you show me your new apartment? And I was like, okay, cool. Totally naive as to what was going on. I had no idea where this was going and so basically we it was within walking distance so we walked to my apartment and i showed her i was like there you go it's just a little studio apartment it's just like something that a college student would live in nothing super fancy but whatever she's like hey why don't you like put on a movie or something I was like, okay i'll put on a movie so i remember i had just bought on vhs because it was still a relatively new movie and i was a huge jim carrey fan at the time so I bought a co- or I had a copy of Dumb and Dumber because you know I'm trying to set the mood here. So I put on Dumb and Dumber and we're sitting on my little couch and we're just watching it. And again, I'm totally oblivious as to what is about to transpire. This was not something that I uh, expected at all. This was not how I thought it was going to happen. It's not even how I wanted it to happen. 
And next thing I know, we're basically making out and then things go from there. And I'll spare you the gory details, but I do remember after it was over, or as over as it could be, considering it was my first time and I had no idea what I was doing, I remember laying there thinking like, that's it? Seven years of my life I've been obsessed with that? I want a refund, Jack. And I remember that the girl ended up spending the night at my apartment. And the next morning, I had to work super early in the morning. I was working in a fast food restaurant flipping burgers. And I had to be at work the next morning for the breakfast shift. So I remember we got up super early and I had to give her a ride home. And I remember I was so uncomfortable and so sort of like ashamed of what had happened that I had to drive her home and she lived, you know, not, it's not, it was a small town, so it wasn't like a huge distance, but it was far enough to where it made for a pretty awkward ride. And I remember as I was driving, I was basically just staring straight ahead, like unnaturally staring straight ahead. And I could feel her like over here sort of like looking at me and trying to make cute faces and like touching the back of my neck. And I'm just like, Ugh. it was like so uncomfortable. And I remember I dropped her off at her house and I was like, okay. And I remember I drove myself to work after that and I got to work and the whole day I was just disappointed. And at the same time, I was so preoccupied that it had actually happened and is that it? And obviously, I suck at this. I need some tutoring. And as it turned out, I found out not long after that, that she was married, which I didn't know. And that was not something that I'd done on purpose. Uh, but as far as the song Miserable Lie goes, I like this song. I love this version of it. If you like the song now, for me, I've always said this about the song Miserable Lie. The first half of the song is great, and I like the lyrics, and I like the music, but... Man, when Morrissey gets into those extremely falsetto gymnastics, it's just something that always sort of makes my butthole pucker. Now, somebody told me one time that they thought that the falsetto vocals on that song were sort of a dig at the band James, who, of course, were rivals of the Smiths back in those days. And I don't know if that's actually true or not. I actually really haven't heard Morrissey ever say much about the band James. If he's not a fan of the band James, though, he must be really stoked that Johnny Morris going out on tour with them this fall out here in the United States. Morrissey's like, yeah, typical. <laughs> uh, anyway, the third song on this album, on this little EP, is... Uh, Reel Around the Fountain. I mean, this is a brilliant version of this song. This is one of my favorite Smith songs of all time. I mean, both instrumentally and lyrically. I mean, this song instrumentally is just like effortly, effortlessly beautiful. It just floats. I mean, it is like instrumental perfection. And lyrically, I mean, this is Morrissey, you know, as the master of his craft. I mean, this proves uh, that, at least to me, this proves that he is one of the greatest lyricists in the history of rock and roll, probably the greatest lyricist uh, in the history of rock and roll. This song is desperate. It's lustful. It's buoyant. Uh, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking. Uh, I have read, some people have theorized that this song is about child molestation, which I totally sort of disagree with that. I don't think there's really any proof of that. And if you read the lyrics, I think it's more like metaphorical than it is literal. Like a lot of things in Morrissey's songwriting, I don't think you take it just as it sits there. I think you have to put a little bit more thought into it. I can see how you might interpret, you know, some of the lyrics as to being sort of, chimo -y, but I don't really think that's what he's saying. I think it's more metaphorical. Uh, the lustful nature of this song reminds me of a situation in college I was in. I've told this story before, so I'll keep it very brief, but there was a girl that I was friends with in college, and I was just obsessed with her. I mean, 
I was just so like desperately in love with her. But at the time, I did not have the onions to sort of pursue any kind of romantic, you know, relationship with her. I just I could not muster up the courage to tell her how I felt and you know ask her if she felt the same way. I think I think I was just paralyzed with my fear of rejection at that point in time. And her and I were friends for probably about a year and a half, and then. She ended up dating another dude, and I couldn't handle it. Or if I handled it, I if I handled it badly, if I handled it at all. Uh, and eventually, it it broke up our friendship because I turned into a total butt over the situation. And I remember one of my friends telling me, "He's like, dude, you know, you should have swung when you were at the plate. I don't know what to tell you. She may have liked you just as much as you liked her. She may not have, but." Now you'll never know. Now she's got some dude. And you're acting like a total putz, son. Uh, the last song on this little EP is Handsome Devil. This is a really cool, clean, snappy version of this song. Uh, proves to me, at least, this EP proves at least to me, that in 1983, the Smiths were already one of the best live bands uh, in the world. Not just, you know, apart from just being the greatest band of all time, they were already such a tremendous live act. Uh, to me, this song has always reminded me of a teacher in my high school uh, who I had, I believe, for 11th grade algebra. Now, most of the time I tell these stories on this channel, I sort of avoid using people's names because uh, out of respect, but because I have no respect for this individual, I will tell you that his name was Mr. Click. And... I believe I had him for 11th grade algebra. And Mr. Click was not only one of the worst teachers I ever had in my entire life, he was just a reprehensible human being. There's a lyric in the song, Handsome Devil, where basically he talks about, hey, I can help you with your exams if you're willing to give me what I want. And the teacher, Mr. Click, Tim Click, he was known or he became guilty of he was arrested for basically offering grades to female students in exchange for sexual favors and he be, he got arrested and it became a big news story in northern california where i'm from now if you don't believe that this is a true story uh, feel free to look him up on the california sex offenders registry because i have looked for him there and sure enough you can find his ugly mug sitting right there as easily as easily as you can click a button i read recently because i've sort of always kind of had this obsession with this teacher because he was like i said he was not only the worst teacher i ever had but he was just unexcusably mean to people that were weird he used to call me a nerd all the time in front of all of my classmates i remember one time i was not particularly a very good student when it came to math History and English, that was stuff that I loved. But math and science, I stunk up the joint. I remember one time we had an exam in algebra and I just bombed it. And I remember he told me that I hadn't even earned an F. He's like, this is so bad, this is like an H or a G. And he said that in front of the entire class. So when he ended up getting arrested for being basically a slime ball. Uh, he would have been looking in the wrong store if he were searching for sympathy for me. Not long ago, I was just reading about him online again because I have this like weird obsession with him. And it turns out that after he was released from custody, he moved to a town in that same vicinity and he basically opened up a, I think it said it was a convenience store, uh, where he was eventually arrested, uh, arrested for having surveillance cameras in the women's bathroom. Awesome. Such a good guy. I do remember him. Timothy Click, if you're interested in looking up. Like I said, normally I try to avoid putting these people's names out there because just out of respect, but no respect for you, son. Uh, anyway, if you haven't listened to the Smith's John Peel session or if you haven't listened to it in a while... 
Uh, I would highly recommend it. Like I said, three of the four songs are available on the Hatful of Hollow compilation as well. The only song not on Hatful of Hollow is Miserable Lie, which, I mean, there's only four songs and all of them are great. But Miserable Lie is probably my weakest of the four songs on this compilation, just as I've always said. There's just something about Morrissey's vocal delivery when it comes to like the second half of that song that I've always just... It kind of stiffens my spine, to be honest with you. Uh, anyway, man, thank you so much for checking out this video. This is Archaic Records. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. Be sure to check back every week for Morrissey Monday, a weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths, as well as other record content and album reviews throughout the week. And until next time, my friends, I'll talk to you then.